I mean, look at this, she's going to give you more. Okay. What immediate actions need to be taken to turn the economy around and stabilize the, do the dollar? Oh, yeah. yeah, just a, a small little question. Within a couple of weeks. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Man, if I, if I had the answer that could immediately have that impact, I'd be a very, very wealthy man. But actually, no, I, I don't think that it, it's too complex to do. I think what we need to do to, in terms of getting the economy back on track and getting jobs created here in Connecticut and in America is just basic things. Targeted, stimulative tax cuts. Let's provide incentives for... Uh, I, I, there, I think it was uh, Reagan's uh, deputy undersecretary for, uh, I, I'm, I think, labor that suggested uh, a $6,000 to $5,000 uh, tax cut for any individual that, uh, any individual uh, company that creates a new job. I think that's great. Now, it doesn't mean that everybody off the bat is going to go out and say, okay, now I'm going to create these many jobs. No, but it means that they'll be incentivized if they're, on the fence, if they're not sure, this will give them that little push to say, let's do it. Let's get this guy a job. Let's get him working, contributing to the economy, being productive, uh, and <laughs> off of a lot of the government programs that coincide with unemployment and whatnot. Do you believe it is politically possible to undo the entitlements bankrupting this country? And if so, what course would you recommend to undo this legislation? You know what? I'm not sure. I'm not certain. Um, the entitlements problem is an incredibly big one. But I don't think that I could honestly stand here in front of you and say that I, I had a direct answer to that question. It's, it's a question that you know, I, I certainly am interested in. And that Maybe part of it? Parts of it? Do you see parts of it that could be reversed or retrenched? You know, that, that's a question that I, I'll take back to my team and that I, I'll also... I'll touch base with uh, with the Independence Caucus. Um, I, I don't think I have uh, a direct answer for that right now. I, I just want to be as clear and straightforward as possible. What do you believe the federal government's role is regarding the Second Amendment? Well, you know, I, I actually, uh, way back when, uh, I think it was a sophomore in high school, I went to a march in Washington. You might have heard of it, the Million Mom March. <laughs> and oh, oh, yeah. and uh, you know, I, I was told, by my teacher. He said, well, do you, do you like kids dying in the street? I said, no, no, I don't like that at all. He said, well, then come with us. I said, all right, sounds like fun. So I went down to this march in Washington and, you know, held up a, a banner that we made. It was a huge banner. Uh, and, uh, you know, Gunnery Against Guns, I think, was the title of it because the school that I was going to at the time, while not a military school, was called the Gunnery. Um, you know, I... I think that there are very sound arguments to be made that there needs to be tighter regulation on guns, but you know, as time progressed, I started you know, to read the Constitution a little bit closer, and I do have uh, I, I, my, my view has changed, and I feel as though the Second Amendment does view guns as an individual right, as opposed to a collective one, and I think that's what the issue comes down to. Now, there can be strong arguments, I believe, made on both sides. And do I grapple with it sometimes? Absolutely, I do. But over the past few years, I, I've, yeah, and I, I've been on the fence of, for this, <coughs> about this for a while, because I personally, I don't own guns. Um, it, it doesn't make me feel too comfortable about the idea of carrying a concealed weapon or anything like that. But I do believe that the framers of our Constitution characterized the Second Amendment to mean that it was, uh, it was an individual right. Okay. Um, what are your thoughts, Will, uh, regarding the Patriot Act? Well, uh, you know, this <laughs> thing passed 99 to 0 in the Senate, and I, I, I think that uh, says quite a bit. I think it says that when it was enacted, we were afraid of, the, uh, uh, of another terrorist attack. I would have voted at the time knowing what I knew then, in support of it, without question. I would have, you know, uh, pushed it forward, absolutely. But what I think was missing from it was a clear and definite sunset clause. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that j just like during a time of war, at certain points, um, you know, martial law can be declared. <coughs> there are uses for that, but they need the restrictions of rights 
if they are enacted in times of immediate crisis, need to be repealed at the soonest possibility. Um, now, this is a unique case in the sense that do we ever know when a war on terror will end? Or as, you know, as some are characterizing it, overseas contingency plans and all, all that kind of stuff. No, we don't. It's a different kind of war. It's not one where, you know, there's a declaration and then at the end there's a, you know, signing of a document on a, a battleship or, you know, at Versailles or something like that. It's different. So I think that we have to have an honest and frank discussion as a nation as to when that sunset clause should be and as to uh, what the indicators of our success in dealing with this issue are. It's a long one. Sorry. Do you believe a state has the right to nullify a federal law? Explain your stance on the fourth, on the tenth amendment, using health care as an example. In other words, if the federal government passes the health care bill as it currently stands, do you believe that it has usurped the rights that belong to the states? If so, what recourse is available to members of Congress? and or to state government? Well, uh, to address the, the latter issue first, uh, yes, I, you know, I, I think that there could be some uh, very, very uh, strong challenges uh, on, on constitutional grounds to the current health care bill. Uh, it, it's pretty clear anything that's not uh, set out you know, in the Constitution, uh, what is it, you know, uh, article, uh, I'm not even going to get into that, but if it's not, if it's not set out uh, to the federal government, those uh, aspects go to the states. I mean, the Tenth Amendment has essentially been walked over, or tr trampled over, really, uh, for actually quite some time now. And as I think we're saying, I think it's in 19 states, maybe it was 17, and it's going to another two, that have uh, passed state uh, memorial uh, bills saying that, hey, we need to remember that there is a Tenth Amendment, and that all those state legislatures I, I think are having an impact and that people in Washington are starting to take notice, but, you know, it's Washington. They're going to try to expand their power as much as possible, as often as possible. Um, so I think there would be very strong uh, grounds to challenge uh, that. Uh, what are your feelings on the Kelo eminent domain case in Connecticut? Yeah, yeah, uh, that, that was, uh, <laughs> I, I wasn't a fan. I wasn't a fan of that, uh, that ruling. Um, I just, for the life of me, can't understand how land can be taken from one private actor and given to another private actor so that the other private actor can make more money. It, it simply doesn't make sense to me. I mean, we believe in national sovereignty. Uh, property rights uh, convey that we feel very strongly about private sovereignty as well. And for that ruling to essentially what was it? They invoked the, the Fifth Amendment, I think it was. I, I, I just, I strongly, strongly disagree with that ruling. 